Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Chapter 13, we're getting close to the end. Not far now, my little Smurfs. Um, we're talking about gene flow. We're talking about the exchanging of genes between populations. Um, a population can gain or lose genes through gene flow. Um, assume that a random mutation shows up in a particular individual, and then that individual leaves that population and goes to another population. That's where an allele can leave. And that will change the percentage of genes, uh, of, of, of certain genes, within the population that they left and in the population that they have moved to. Um, ultimately, however, the gene flow will reduce uh, differences between populations um, because if they continue to exchange, not just a one-time event, if they continue to exchange, then those mutations, those changes, will uh, be shared between these two separate populations. Um, an individual's relative fitness. This goes back to something that we discussed um, uh, a few videos ago, and that is different reproductive success. Each individual does not have the same chance at reproducing as every other individual. Your ability to reproduce or your chance at reproduction is referred to as your relative fitness. How fit are you? Not as in how fit are you, but how well do you fit the environment? The better you fit the environment, the higher your relative fitness, it means you're going to contribute more genes to the next generation. How do you contribute more genes to the next generation? The way that you do that is by having more children. And again, you have to imagine, you have to keep in mind a, um, a natural situation, native person sort of environment. Um, native person that better fits their environment, better able to move in their environment, better, better able to hide in their environment, better able to find food in their environment is going to do better. And if they do better, they're going to get more food. If they get more food, they have more energy. If they have more energy, they're able to uh, last longer during lean times. They're able to fight off disease easier. Um, all of these things will all point towards them having more children and having more of their children survive to adulthood. That's your relative fitness. If you have a high fitness, um, more of your kids are going to make it to adulthood. If you have a low fitness, fewer of your children are going to make it to adulthood. As natural selection works on a population, these uh, pressures, these selective pressures can actually change um, a population. We've talk, talked about that. We said it's microevolution. And in changing these populations, um, uh, by natural selection, changing the gene frequencies, what this does is this changes what's called the bell curve. Um, and if you think about um, height, just imagine uh, if we're going to take everybody in class and we're going to line them all up by height. And we're going to start with the shortest on the one end and we're going to go to the tallest on the other end. Where are most people going to fall? They're going to fall in the center. So more people are going to be at average height. Very few are going to be very short. Very few will be very tall. Well, what if only the tallest people could reach the fruit at the top of the tree? If that's the case, then what happens to the shorter people? They don't have that adaptation, therefore they're not going to do as well, they're not going to get as much food. So what would happen to the average height if this was allowed to continue over many generations? You would think that more people would be taller because if the short people can't get food and only the tall people can, then that means that um, they're going to be more successful. Tall people will have a higher relative fitness. So what's going to happen to our curve then? It's going to get shifted towards the high side. This is referred to as directional selection, pushing the curve to one particular uh, side. Um, stabilizing selection is where the average is favored, but the extremes are not. Again, so what happens if we take and we uh, measure everybody based on uh, height again? And... If you're too tall this time, you can't make it through the forest because there are low-hanging branches. But if you're too short, 
you can't reach up to the branches that there are to be able to get food. So now, if you're too tall, you can't make it through the forest. If you're too short, you can't reach high enough. So who's going to be favored now? The people in the center, the people that are just the right height. They're not too tall. They're not hitting branches with their head when they're walking around. They're not too short. They, they can't, uh, so short they can't reach the branch. So now we're talking about the middle. Only the people that are average size are the ones in it that are going to do well. So too tall, their success is lower. Too short, their success is lower. So who's going to be favored? The ones in the center. This is called stabilizing selection. Last is disruptive selection, and disruptive selection favors the extremes. And I can't really give you a good example for our people walking around. Uh, maybe the tall people, again, can get stuff from the top of the trees, and short people can gather stuff from around the base of the tree, but average height people aren't favored. So now if you're really tall, you do good. If you're really short, you do good. But if you're average height, you don't do well. And this kills the curve. And so let's look at these each. Uh, this is using uh, color, coat color, a pale mouse, an average color gray mouse, and then a dark mouse. Stabilizing selection is only the center is favored, the extremes are selected against, and so what happens is you get a lot more of these individuals in this uh, center region. Directional selection, if the animals are found in a dark environment, then what's going to happen is if the light individuals aren't going to do as well, the dark ones will do better. So it's going to be pushed, the curve is pushed towards that dark side. Disruptive selection, the extremes are favored. If you're white, you do well. If you're dark, you do well. But if you're gray, you don't do well. All right. So you're selecting against the average. You're selecting for one extreme. You're selecting against both extremes. Stabilizing selection, directional selection, disruptive. Another kind of selection can be sexual selection. Individuals of one sex will often choose mates of the other sex. And what I mean by that is that most of the time in most populations, the females get to pick who she wants to have babies with. Most of the time, it is the women who decide who their mates will be. Um, men will throw their attention out to several different women, hoping that one will say yes. One individual woman will have the attention of several different men, and she will pick one to go with, to be with. All right, This is referred to as sexual selection. That one, for some reason, had traits that she was interested in. What traits is a woman interested in? What trait is the female interested in? It really depends on the species as to what specific traits you're looking for. But the all pretty much universal thing is she's looking for generally a large male um, because that means that he's healthy. He was able to grow big enough. Um, generally, they want an older male because he's been able to live long enough. And generally, they want what's referred to as a successful male who has good genes. Um, if you're talking about humans, that kind of throws the monkey wrench into the works. If you think about it in terms of a frog or a deer. It makes a lot more sense. What does successful mean? It means bigger, it means older. It means he's able to survive long enough, he's able to get enough food, he's able to uh, escape predators. Um, this is what is, the female is looking for. Deer is a really good example. What do, do the male deer use to fight for females? They use their antlers. And so females will look at and will select for males that have a larger rack. Well, what is that going to do then to the size of the rack of the deer? If the females are consistently choosing males with a bigger rack, what will that do to the size of the rack over time? It'll make it larger. And actually, a better example of this isn't deer's antlers. It is peacock tails. Sexual selection pretty much only works with sexual dimorphism. Di means two. What does morph mean? No, it doesn't mean change. Morph means shape. So sexual dimorphism means two shapes. What are the two shapes? The male shape and the female shape. A really good example of that is humans. Males have a particular shape that is different from females. Another one would be deer. Males have a shape with the antlers that females don't have. Uh, peacocks are another good example. We'll talk about peacocks in just a second. 
But males and females have different characteristics that are not directly associated with reproduction or survival. Uh, those antlers, that doesn't actually help him um, to breed a female better. It's just a way of him displaying his health and fighting other males for, uh, for, for does. This is a great example of sexual dimorphism. So this is a peacock. This is a peahen. They're called peafowl. Peacock means male peafowl. Peahen means female peafowl. What is the whole purpose of this tail? The whole purpose of this tail is to attract her attention. This is what she's looking for. This is a sign of health. He is showing her, look how healthy I am. Look how much energy I have to put into this big, beautiful, huge tail that is pointless, that is useless. This huge tail is actually a detriment to him. Peafowl are natively found in India. And in India, you also find tigers. Tigers will actually eat peafowl when they can catch them. And it's really easy to eat a peacock. The way you eat a peacock, the way a tiger catches a peacock, is just by doing this. Slapping his paw down on the peacock's tail and preventing it from flying away. So it's actually a detriment to the male peacock in terms of survival, but it's a benefit in terms of it gets her attention. And she will therefore allow him to mate with her. 